Hello and welcome. Today we've got Mick McKenna from the VACC who will share insights into his role as the industry policy advisor. Yeah, it's a great topic on consumer law and something that impacts everybody in the industry, especially from a dealer perspective. So let's jump into it. Mick, thanks very much for joining us today. Great to have you on the show. Thank you. Maybe to start things off, can you just explain what is the VACC and what sort of role you play? Sure. Uh, the VACC, which is the acronym for the Victorian Automotive Chamber of Commerce, is a 105-year-old automotive retailing institution. It covers not just new car deals or all MCTs, used car deals, motorcycle deals, farm machinery deals. It also covers the entire breadth of the retail motoring industry. Our, our largest sector, in fact, is the automotive aftermarket repair sector with close on 2,500 independent members. We are the largest employer of automotive apprentices in Australia. We we have some 550 automotive apprentices that are hosted out to uh, member and non-member businesses for, for a, a fee, whatever the case may be. VACC also has the largest technical uh, library in the Southern Hemisphere. It's um, it's one of those um, type of facilities that the the serious mechanical boffin likes to come and have a see the library because every, there's a lot of things that are in print, but it's all digitised nowadays. And we have a um, have a, a um, information sharing agreement or a licensing agreement, I suppose you put with um, Motortech, um, which members can subscribe to, which is one of the key pillars of that, and probably all key services that. Some of our five and a half thousand members like to uh, to use and, and utilize a lot. Unfortunately, is the industrial relations side of the business when it comes to hiring, firing, disciplining workers, so on and so forth, wages and, and so on. I believe that uh, that is probably the most world class service in that regard in Australia. It is um, it's heavily utilized by non-members and referred to by a lot of other federally based um, associ associations and some government departments. We defer to them and sit on many, many, many different uh, boards and councils advising on industrial relations and, and that field. Is, it's a minefield and it's dangerous and that's what members really need, keep them from having an adverse action launched against them by an employee or by a union or so on and so forth. We're certainly not anti-union, but we're here to protect the employer. My role at VACC is um, I've, I'm in what we call the policy department, the policy division. And there's five of us in there who run, you know, across the 16 to 17 different industry sectors. I am responsible for all of the licensed motor car trader sectors within Victoria, that being the new and new, uh, new car dealers that incorporate used car dealers as well, the motorcycle dealers, the farm industrial machinery dealers. And um, I assist my good colleague, Dr. Imogen Reed, with the running of the commercial vehicle dealers only from the, from the angle of franchise dealer operations. VACC uh, is the peak retail automotive group we like to think in Australia we're, we're very effective we're very large we're very well resourced and my role is to, is to do advocacy is to meet with politicians bureaucrats so on and so forth have I got a very big and heavy presence in all my members businesses throughout the year I try to really get to those country regions Hamilton Mildura um, the out of Gippsland areas and, and, and Madonga and all those type of places Horsham um, at least once a year there is an important to us as as a, as a big metro guy, the the Eagers, the the Gazmax, these type of entities, and all members to me in that regard are, are, are all equal. I suppose one of the really big areas that we do that we are strong in is the country. VACC was formed in Bendigo and uh, and and some parts of Ballarat, so we have a really deep rooted connection to um, our regional Victoria. And uh, I try to I, I just try to be visible and and, and answer the questions on the ground. With 30 years experience in auto logistics and state-of-the-art locations in five major Australian cities, Precar Fleet Services are a premier all-in-one solutions provider for commercial vehicle fleet operators, leasing companies, and original equipment manufacturers. Please visit precar.com.au and click on the link to Fleet Services. Now, Mick, a very complex question is around consumer law and how it impacts dealers and buying of cars and car ownership. We can't cover it all this evening. Maybe if you can tell us what are the main issues at the moment and how is it impacting your members? What we're seeing now, um, John, is I'll just regale you with a quick story that uh, I'm not sure if you guys know Eddie Albanecco, who was Melbourne's cheapest cars. I rang Ed probably at the tail end of COVID-1 in Victoria. We were talking about stock supply. Ed's big concern, and it's turned out to be a truism, is that dealers are going to be tempted into purchasing cars that they normally never would have looked at in the past because they needed to get their hands on stock and the competition for prices, you know, the old supply and demand 
And um, dealers were, were buying these cars. The, the, the competition was intense, and that's that's what you want in the market is intense competition. And they were they were forced in they were forced. I use the word forced in, into purchasing cars. They not only would would have passed up or just bounced off, and would have ended up in the private market or out of the auctions or whatever the case is. That's one angle. But they're also the price of vehicles went to such an extreme, and, I, and I'm sure we all saw it and read about it. And 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 the LMCTs in Victoria and I'd imagine in every other state were having a, an unexpected. Boom time. But with that comes a few consumer issues. First of all, the consumer issue is that pe- people who are buying those cars that are usually at the bottom end were paying not a premium, but but a little bit more of a price than would be expected. So therefore, the expectation and how that vehicle might operate significantly changed. Likewise, people who paid at the top end of the market and paid the premium, paid a genuine, we would consider to be a genuine premium, w- were the same. Both of them, when the market's starting to fall, are now starting to to feel the effects of paying what they probably thought think is what they think is was too much. And now what we're seeing is, and it's always been around as far as consumers and, and motor cars are concerned, is a real bout of of buyer's remorse. And that is a very frustrating thing for a dealer to deal with because the issue is never addressed as buyer's remorse. It's it's a feeling. It's it's the excuses you see. It's 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 the complaints of the customer that make you realise that they're trying to cash out and get out of what they consider to be a bad deal. They've ever overfinanced. And to that point, some some of the issues that we're seeing right now being labelled as either being entered into um, tribunals such as VCAT. We really hope they're not silly enough to enter them into place and go to a lawyer and enter them into the magistrate's court. I mean, nobody wins there except our, our friends' lawyers. And we're seeing some claims, and and they're for things like. It's, it's usually both centered on the Bluetooth or or these type of things that they either they're saying that it has an inconsistency in it. The the this is in new cars. It's usually a transmission problem of some degree. Some of the European transmissions, the, you've you've really got to make sure that the consumers are sticking strictly to the service scheduling on these things. The the manufacturer makes these cars and puts that service schedule out for a specific reason. As soon as consumers start mucking around with that and missing services here or maybe using the wrong parts, not non-genuine, but not even high-quality aftermarket parts, and there is a lot of high-quality aftermarket parts out there. We all know that. The Ryco filters and all these type of things are fantastic stuff. They're as good as not better than the um, than the original. But once they start doing once they start doing that or they source their own parts on the web and bring them over, they're asking for trouble. And what they're asking the dealer to do is fix their problems that they created. And that's really not reasonable. At the bottom end of the market, though, is, is where is, there is a real concern for, for for consumers and dealers. We're seeing recently um, cases where people have bought dual cab utes with up to 300, 400,000 Ks on them. But the issue is that they're expecting new light performance from these, from these vehicles. And it's just not reasonable or possible for it to happen. Usually it's electronic base it's not like back in our days where it, it, it would needed a service or or all those type of things the, the problems now are they're, they're, they're usually transmission related um, but that's because the vehicle has been used in a way that it shouldn't have been in a lot of cases in a lot of cases the consumers are right that the car is not a good car I, I, we don't acknowledge the word lemon at vacc because there's no such thing as a lemon there's no lemon law anywhere in um, in Victoria. We just say the car of that age is, is performing exactly as that car of that age or those kilometres should be expected to perform. And the consumer expectation needs to be brought down. The, the, the issues often are exacerbated with the consumer when the consumer expects a new, either a new vehicle to replace it with or new parts to in, in the repair of the vehicle. Now, that's not reasonable. If you've got a two, three, four hundred thousand K or fifty, even fifty thousand K, the Australian consumer law is quite clear that you can use refurbished or or secondhand parts in the repair or service of that vehicle. However, people, some people are, are egged on by what they read in certain forums online, from what they're told by some some consumer groups and, and even some government uh, officers of fair trading about what their rights are. And we, we we have a good relationship with Consumer Affairs in Victoria. They provide us with stats. We we provide them with feedback, what's going on in the industry and and who we we think are causing some issues throughout the industry. But they're not experts on the Australian consumer law by any stretch. They've got a lot of acts that they've got to deal with there. We at VACC try to um, take as much of that load off them as we can. We have a resource at VACC, a guy called John Kane. The purpose of John is to act as a consumer advisor for, for customers of people of customers of VACC members who may have a problem with our member 
um, with the work they've done, even if it's just to report bad customer service, John will act as a mediator or go between to keep that case out of VCAT court or whatever the case is. So again, a lot of consumer issues out there at the moment. How many of them are genuine? I'm not quite sure. If it's a genuine issue, you tend to see in the majority and and I don't have any stats to uh, support this, but the majority of deals just look after the problem, get on and fix whatever they've got to fix. They don't want the drama. There's a handful of deal, uh, LMCTs who won't do it, and it's frustrating for us. And, yeah, some of them are VACC members. Um, we try to cancel them, A, to protect their licence, to protect their business, but also to protect the image of the of the industry. The issues are, are many. They're technical. Some of them are really sad. Um, but the good dealers, and then and most of them are good dealers, just get on and fix it. I do a lot of briefings around dealerships. Forget the principle of the matter. Yeah, you don't like the customer. The customer yelled at you. They got sad. They did all those things. That's going to happen. That's life. That's that's a reaction when they think that something's gone wrong that, that you're responsible for. But if it's going to cost you 500 to to 1000 bucks to keep you out of VCAP, to take two people for a day or more into Melbourne, to have to... To, to run the gauntlet of actually losing the case and to do all those things, just pay the money. You've won the customer over to then you might have helped even retain that customer. Again, we've just got to make sure that um, that calm heads are, are prevailing and that um, when they're dealing with issues, they're communicating with the customer. Consumers have rights. And may I add, so does industry. We've just got to make sure that nobody's rights are being trampled. It's interesting, Mick, when you say the, uh, the in the post-COVID environment because this podcast was born basically out of the changing circumstances of, of COVID. And we're seeing so many knock-on effects uh, with COVID. And it's interesting when I think of just one key step, when you're just describing what Eddie was telling you very early in the piece, and I love oracles of the industry that can pick it in advance because he's spot on. Buyer's remorse has been around forever, but the issue is you've accelerated the amount of buyer's remorse because you ratcheted up the price point for everybody. So there was this whole need for motorite for, for mobility. And it's interesting that the stat that still stands out for me, we talked about it in one of our previous podcasts, where the Australian car park went from 19.7 million to 21.4 million from pre-COVID to now. In fact, I think we've, I'm waiting for the data to come out this year. I think it's going to be even more than 21.4. So there's a million extra cars on the road. And the average age of the car park increased by year. So it's actually 11.3 versus 10.4, which was... Uh, it's getting to New Zealand-like numbers, isn't it? Yeah. So you've got older cars that are, co- that are a higher price, that have done more Ks, and aren't necessarily in the great condition. Because the industry, for some reason, we've always fixated on how many new cars being sold. And we think that the EV car park right now must be huge. Well, I think it's I think it, we've, we've cracked 100,000 actual EVs on the road, as in sole EVs. There's, what, 400,000 hybrids, but there's 21 million cars. So we're still a drop in the ocean. We may see a few Teslas. And when you see something have 237% growth or, or a skewed figure like that, you know you're starting from a low baseline. Yes. So, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But now, now, having said that, let's got to, let me put this note on there and, and citation. I drive an electric vehicle. Uh, so I love it. I love them. So, but again, uh, stats are stats and reality is reality. But anyway, you, you're right. Um, it's always good to speak to people like Ed and, and Paul O'Halloran and these type of guys in Victoria who know what's going on. And uh, the guys out at, um, at Rob McDonald and all these guys at the auction places because they know what's going on. They've seen it before um, in different circumstances, but they've seen the same type of thing before. But yeah. So we, talk, we talked about the, uh, the the nature of the complaints. So going forward, given the ageing market of uh, the ageing car park, do you see these issues continuing or do you feel that as the prices adjust, the expect, consumer expectations will be moderated and you'll get less cases? Because the other question, the second part of that question is, are the actual case, is the caseload increasing as a result of this because the car park's bigger and the prices were higher? Really good question, Mark. The answer about will we see more and more? Yeah, I believe we will. We're going to, it's just human nature now. And we've got this call out society and everyone knows their rights. Um, we're becoming litigious. Um, it's a, uh, I see litigious or litigation as some people's opportunity to unjustly enrich themselves. So the the answer is, yeah, I, I think it's going to continue to rise. Um, I think there's a real challenge for governments to sort out tribunals, to sort out what's a genuine issue and what's a vexatious claim or issue within places like VCAT and the Magistrates Court. I would 
really uh, we, we, we're calling for greater resources and VCAT and issues um, state budget funded out of LMCT money, mind you. So to keep our guys out of there, but just to stop the time wasting going on in these places and the emotional financial turmoil that it does cause to to our, our members, but to also make sure that, that the government can also see what LMCTs are the ones that are constantly rearing their head in these sort of places and to do something about them. Because we've always said, VACC, the government here, the regulators know who the dickhead traders are. We will always support them when they do something about them. But don't judge the rest of the industry based on the behaviour of 10 to 20 out of LMCTs based out of 2,200 LMCTs in Victoria. Many times they are correct, the consumers. There is something wrong and there is a dispute. But they're the ones that should be going to VCAT and to be heard and to be heard fair or, to, or the court. But oh, probably mediation is the best thing because a law professor I had just a couple of years ago told me that only dickheads litigate. You will, you never need to go to court. You should mediate your way through and settle that way um, because the the, the risk or, or it's not a smart strategy to go with to put to cash all your chips based upon something. This is what we try to tell our dealers. Let's mediate our way through this and, and save everyone some pain. Not that you're not right. You may be right. You know, the court may find you right, but gee, it's a long, it's a long way to prove it. The, the Australian consumer law in itself is a good law if applied properly. Unfortunately, I, I think that when you've got industry associations such as ours, such as AADA, such as um, the other MTAs, who seem to know more about the ACL than most state-based offices of fair trading and, and other federally-based organisations, it's almost so now that... and. Five years ago, I couldn't have said this, Mark. I can go, I can read a VCAT case and I read crystal ball it. I'm pretty well right most of the time because I think the the, v, uh, the, the VCATs of the world are now cottoned on to a lot of this, a lot of this, oh, what's right and what's wrong, whether it be the LMCT or the, or the uh, consumer. I've even been in cases where the consumers have been challenged at the very onset of the case to justify the amount of their claim. Mick, what are some of the protections customers have and what would be the implications for dealers if they don't meet those requirements. Can you just give us a few examples? Well, look, the, the very first protection we have in Victoria, particularly, if, let's talk about used cars. You When you buy a used car from an LMCT in Victoria, as opposed to a private person, when you buy a car from an LMCT, you're afforded protections under the Motor Car Traders Act. And that offers guarantees to clear title. It gives a statutory warranty on vehicles, 160,000 kilometres, 10 years old. The protections for the consumer, are if there is an issue, there's seven or eight different Terms of reference contained within the Motor Car Traders Act. This is a bit dry, this subject, but it's important that we understand it. And particularly clear title and stat warranty obligations. If a dealer breaches those, the consumers can put in a claim to what's called the Motor Car Traders Guarantee Fund. And the fund is made up of the 2,200 Victorian LMCTs, license fees that goes into a, a kitty for want of a better word. And there's a, uh, there's a committee that sits and hears cases on there. And if the case is admitted, the dealer must pay. Uh, the, the consumer gets refunded out of that fund. Um, then the trader must pay. In essence, it works that the trader must pay the fund that money by a certain period. Otherwise, they will lose their license. We guard that fund and we guard the whole concept of of a con the consumer protection regime surrounding that fund. We guard it fiercely because we think it's a really good and just system. The terms of reference are very clear. But what we're seeing is a lot of these consumer groups using it incorrectly because they're not using the terms of reference. They, they say that the LMCTs are not playing ball or that the system's against them when the Motor Car Traders Guarantee Fund rightfully won't admit the claim because it doesn't meet the terms of reference. This doesn't mean the consumer then can't go to the next course of action and go through VCAT or the courts and take that thing. Now, here's the kicker for you that a lot of dealers, we're trying to educate dealers on and we try to educate the consumer groups as well. The manufacturers have a massive role to play in all these claims. It's their product at the end of the day. It's particularly the, the 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 lines are not blurred or they're very clear if it, you're the first owner of a vehicle and a dealer fixes your vehicle or or you have a right as a consumer to either go to the selling dealer or to the manufacturer and and seek a remedy. Now I've got to say, from my experience, there are some magnificent manufacturers out there who just get on with it and do it. Mazda, for instance, I think really do it well, They, they the decision they leave, and I think it's a right decision, is if it's going to be an ACL claim where the where the dealer is going to seek indemnity from the manufacturer, they leave it for the dealer to make that decision and they support that decision. I think that's fantastic. So there's a lot of protections there for the consumer, but I, I suppose that the best thing for the consumer to do 
in any instance, if they do have these issues, just go to the dealer. Franchise dealers are usually a lot, and I'm going to use the word easier to deal with because the staff there are many, the resources tend to be a little bit deeper, and the training is very real and and, and mandated by the by the manufacturer. And they also use utilize people like us in, in their dealership quite often and so on. Just go there and talk to the dealer. And I can tell you the need to lodge in these sort of places and go through that emotional and financial turmoil that we were talking about before just dissipates. Depending on how long you've had the car and and, and how reasonable the consumer is and, and putting a reasonable person's head on, are they prepared to work with the dealer on the solution and contribute to the solution? Because quite often it may be a the genesis or the source of the issue may be because of the way the vehicle's been handled or serviced or so on and so forth, and the dealer still comes to the party. So the consumer, I suppose it's up to the dealers to keep the to keep the scenario as calm and serene as possible, and that works great. It's when the consumers start jumping up and down and threatening and wanting to punch up and do those things, and we see it in dealerships. It's actually, it's actually quite rife, and whether that's because the consumers um, are minded in such an aggressive way or whether they think they've been run around circles or whether the dealership staff have just been provocative or non-caring or whatever. There's many reasons why it might happen. But again, as we all know, in any in any partnership or any negotiation, the, the calmest party usually has a win. There's, what's that saying? You know, like if you can keep your head while everyone else around there is losing theirs, you're, you're miles in front of the game. And that's the thing that a lot of dealers are now starting to learn. We insist when dealers call us with these things, you say, you have to, you have to get the issue in writing from the person because when you get an issue, a complaint in writing from a consumer, when it comes to an issue, particularly if it's dealing with the ACL and they've gone online and they've done their research and they've looked at, you know, this forum and that forum and whatever, and the Consumer Affairs told me this and ACCC told me that. And well, if you get the issue in writing from, from it does two things. It lets you know what the problem is and it lets you accelerate the, the issue up the ladder. It lets you know what the consumer wants as a potential remedy so there can be no doubt what they want. But importantly, from the dealer perspective, it stops, it stops the consumer from changing the goalposts continuously when there's an issue. And from there, we say to dealers, just deal with the issue. Prepare, don't let it be forgotten about. Speak about it. Have, have notes on it. And also let your OEM know at the very first opportunity, even if they're not the original owner of the car, because they still have an obligation to that car under this train consumer law. And what you want is you want the OEM at the table with you, back fighting the fight with you, contributing to any any payment that may may or may not come. And that makes sense because the customer is both the OEM's customer and the dealer's customer. And this is one, in fact, John, we had that as a, a topic on one of our earlier podcasts, who owns the customer? Well, it's actually a three-way uh, process. It's that there's the customer, there's the dealer, and there's the OEM. In the case where OEMs don't sell directly. So uh, if it's an agent, different story, but with a franchise dealer, with a franchise dealer, it's that you know, the dealer, it's the dealer's customer, but it's also the OEM's customer, so there's equity there involved. But what I'm keen to ask is, what other protections do you see uh, potentially coming into play. ACL is, is Australian consumer law is there now, and it's it is very robust and it offers consumers great protection in you know, buying a significant uh, item such as an automobile and even getting service. So, do you see any in, in your conversations with government? Do you see any other iterations or additions to the current state that present challenges for your members and other players in the industry? At the moment in Victoria, we're fighting off. And I don't I just say it's a maximum likelihood, but the threat of an industry-funded lemon law ombudsman. And that to me would be one of the most unjust and unnecessary waste of resources I could imagine any industry facing. I understand why you would have it for energy regulators and I understand why you'd have it for financial services and so on and so forth. But to have it for motor cars. And for people who purchase motor cars, when you've got to keep in mind that our argument has always been that a motor vehicle is not a passive object. It is, it doesn't, it's not a toaster, it doesn't sit on the same bench top for 12 years. It is experiencing all different types of stresses and and impact every day it's used. Um, it's driven different ways, different conditions, so on and so forth. And it's a very complex product. You know, there's, there's pieces to it everywhere. We have some consumer groups in Victoria who 
what they put up to the Victorian government a year or two ago in their pre-budget submission was for industry to fund an ombudsman by uh, paying an additional, each LMC to pay an additional $3,000 a year on top of their licensing fees to fund an ombudsman. On top of that, they wanted the taxpayer to fund $4 million or $1 million a year over the first four years of the scheme. And they wanted all the residual funds that come out of the LMCT Motor Car Traders Fund to also go towards this ombudsman service. I think we did a calculator. I can't remember the, off the top of my head what the figure was, but I think it was going to cost dealers some $20,000 a year more just to do that. And and these are, and this is to point every deal. So, for instance, I can tell, I could rattle you off the name of 100 LMCTs within 60 seconds who have never, ever had a VCAT claim go against them, but they're expected to pay to support such a fund, which is just it's just naive. It's naivety 101. We've seen these groups also now um, put a together a paper of into the hands of decision makers in Victoria and other supporters and others on the other side of the fence like me, um, using a what I consider to be a very loose research methodology where they surveyed X amount of people over four or five years who have bought a motor vehicle and had a problem with it. And the raft of problems goes from a flat tyre all the way to a major issue. Now, there is an element of truth to some of their research in their paper, there's no doubt. But the research methodology they used is is, is misleading, we believe. And um, until we see the raw data, we say it cannot be believed. So they're looking to do this uh, as, as one option. And they're also looking to work with the various regulators and have Australian consumer law provisions inserted into the State-Based Motor Car Traders Act. If VCAT is the problem and VCAT's clogged up, the VCAT is not clogged up because motor car traders are clogging it up. It's clogged up because there's spurious cases, all vexatious cases being loaded in there, and not just in the, in the goods and services, in the whole thing in tenancy, guardianship, um, building permits, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, conversations with the government are that some are brushing it off with, oh, don't worry about it, it's a waste of time. Others are, are quite concerned about it, and rightfully so, and so they should be because there are consumers who are who are not getting a fair go. But the amount of consumers who are not getting a fair go pales into insignificance when compared to other industries, and we're talking about industries like the building industry, we're talking industries like the IT industry. LMCTs are only responsible for just over 1% of, of as respondents in, in VCAT claims in Victoria. We're responsible for... Only six, just over six percent of goods and services hearings as the respondent in Victoria. It may not be an issue about the quality or the performance of a motor vehicle. It might be a contractual dispute about the finance and a whole lot of other things. So even in those figures, we're being generous. At VACC, we are and our dealers, and we take all of our policy direction when it comes to industry operations. I can tell you now, comes from the. The industry, if we think it's a really bad idea, we'll say, hey, we think this is not not wise. Hopefully they listen. But on the whole, the stuff's pretty good. And we just have to we just have to make it a little bit more sophisticated. We have now asked the government to not only to uh, use LMCT funds to to fund VCAT for to vet out spurious claims, we're asking the government to also fund VACC with part of the money used by the not-for-profit consumer facing groups, or give partial funding that you've given to them to us. And then what we can do is we can put on two, three or four lawyers and have our own unit. And that will not just be for VACC members, that will be for any person with an issue on a motor car in Victoria. And we can guarantee you a success rate of at least five times what the not-for-profit groups have had. But the message is that we're here, we can help, we want to help, we always offer to help. What I don't know what other conclusion we can come to when, we're, when we've been able to show that there is no market failure in the automotive industry as far as consumer detriment goes. In fact, it's probably the most protected industry in Victoria, and it was it was made made that way because in the seventies it was the true wild west. Well, it's cleaned up now. I can tell you. So, who would be the not for profit organisations that you're talking about? So, these are people that are representing the consumer groups. They're, they're government organisations that. Or the, the, the whole source of being is to look after the most vulnerable people in our community. And everybody supports that. But we say use your resources to get better social outcomes for your for those people in ten, in rental tenancies, in the cost of living, in the cost of energy, the cost of these things. Don't come after us or, or use the automotive industry to continue your line of funding with the Victorian government or the Australian government. And it puts a lot of pressure on the industry. It doesn't put any pressure on VACC. But what it does, it, it makes a lot of good people in our sector say, you know what, this is just getting too tough. I'm competing against a private market that's not regulated. 
They're not paying the proper amounts of duty. They're not they're not paying for ACL things. They haven't got these consumer groups all over them. You know, this is too hard. I'm going to get out. And the conversations I have with people like that every day in our sector are very real. And and I feel for them because they, the frustration's real. So those groups, I, we say, work with us. We've offered to work with you in, in, and we've done it in good faith with no strings attached. We've offered to to pay for all matter of things because, as, as I said before, we're a very res- uh, well-resourced organisation and dealers by their very nature, by their own contributions to community, are very generous people. If a dealer's got to pay an extra 20 or 30 grand a year, there's going to be a footy club, a calisthenics club, a spina bifida organisation, an, an autistic association. Someone's going to miss out on money because the money's got to come from somewhere. The government, blame the regulator. They know who the shonky operators are. Go to the private market, have a look there. Go onto Marketplace and have a look at the amount of people who have been let down by other consumers on that page. It, it's really disheartening and it's disappointing. But you know what? They're not caused by LMCTs. Can you explain to us what sort of service you provide and how you do some of the research? Do you go overseas? Do you have research delegations looking at consumer law in Europe? And then where can people in the, in the industry, your members, where can they find this information? Do you put it out in research papers or how do you share this information with what you've found? We have a tremendous amount of um, member-facing research and and, go, and and publicly accessible research on our webpage, www.vacc.com.au. We also, every bulletin we send out and every submission that we put into government or every position paper that we do is on that webpage for, for our members and for interested parties to to read and, and to pass comment on. We welcome comment, good or bad. We'd love to know everybody's views, be it member, non-member, parliamentarian or Joe Schmo from the back blocks of Lara. We we need to know and we want to know. To answer your question, we we provide all that information. Our research capacity or capability is huge. We do, and we've been lucky enough, like we said, to have a, a Deba Fatah, Dr. Deba Fatah, now come and replace the, uh, the legendary Steve Bletsos in our industry, and um, and she brings a different skill set with her, which is is contemporary. It's very modern. It's been really refreshing. We do a hell of a lot of um, member briefings and member nights, but I, I tend to do member briefings more based at the dealerships because the dealership groups are so big now, and um, we do briefings, and they're mainly on the Australian consumer law and, and, and basic tax stuff, and they're aimed at the staff at grassroots. And if the DPs or the business owners have a more serious in-depth problem, I'm happy to have a one-on-one with them or to, or to put them in the right direction. We have a lot of engagement with Tier 1 and Tier 2 lawyer, uh, legal firms and professional service providers, Deloitte, the HWL Ebsworths, the BDOs, to really to guide our members in, in certain areas and, and to put on certain seminars and briefings for us in our industrial relations team. We also have a, our own strong posse of lawyers over there in industrial relations. So we're continuously doing it like this. Um, we, we do quite a few webinars. We're doing one, this fuel efficiency standard, which we're anticipating will have over 200 um, Victorian Automobile Dealer Association members and also members of the farm machinery and motorcycle industry because they're worried about what the future holds for them with these new federal government um, standards. We communicate to an excessive level at times and sometimes might fatigue our members with information overload. We also um, we work very, very strongly with our national body, the Motor Trades Association of Australia. We, we do a lot of political engagement with members, I've, I've taken a position of when I actually meet with a politician, not the bureaucrat, but the politician, I always take a member with me. I always, because they don't want to hear what Mick McCann has got to say. They know what I've got to say. They want to hear from Sid Sentendag or Paul Hopper, or they want to hear from, you know, um, Paul Batali Farm Machinery or Matt Jones Motorcycles or Daniel Crawford's, you know, um, CMV trucks. They want to hear from them. We're not desk bound by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, Jeff Gwillem and the VACC Executive Board are very keen for us to, to all of us, not just the policy managers, but people who who make a difference, to get out in the field and and to talk with members and not so much educate, but just to listen. So, yeah, so that's that's what we do. We do a lot of stuff. Um, what we don't know, we bring in those experts. Overseas travel, uh, I did a, uh, a two or three weeks sojourn in the Midwest USA last year uh, where I worked with the um, – the, the North American Equipment Deals Association, the farm machinery guys in, in Missouri for a week. And then I worked for a week with the um, Indiana Dealers Association there. 
Uh, Indiana is a state of similar population to Victoria and so on and so forth and and still has strong manufacturer presence and I was quite amazed at the engagement they get from their members um, but they get really good strong engagement and they run really well and it was an eye-opener. My, my, my good colleague John Curry who runs the aftermarket divisions uh, he's over to SEMA every year. Uh, Jeff Quillam is, does, has done an extensive tour of um, particularly the Scandinavian countries, about the electric vehicle stuff. He's heading over to Switzerland and a few other places with our president and a few other members to look at, I guess, the Geneva Motor Show, but there's a whole lot of other stuff with regards to end-of-life vehicles and and electric vehicles that we need to know. And the, the importance of that type of a, a visit is has been accelerated with some nice uh, efficiency standards announcement. So we, we try to remain ahead of the curve. We do a lot of work with other associations. In particular, we uh, work very well with MTAA. We work very well with um, uh, AADA. You know, um, AADA certainly now is taking the lead on the franchising stuff. That's fantastic. Um, we prefer to look more at taxes and um, skills and so on and so forth at the moment. Um, and so whilst that's happening, the deals benefit. So that would be our position. It, it really shows the, the depth and breadth of what the VACC does for the industry. And I think this is the important part, because ultimately, if you have a strong industry, you actually have a good, a strong and educated industry, you actually have a good customer experience. Because as you mentioned, you're, you're actually, the, the, the VAC and the industry don't like that small percentage that give the industry the stigma. Yep. And you're right, back in the 70s, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the, yeah. the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Willacy at seven o'clock chasing the used car dealer <laughs> yeah. down the road type stuff. Because that's what it was. Yeah. But it's not that now. And, no. uh, you know, you've got digital uh, social media and digital communications. It's an instant world. You know, we've seen the, you know, the, when, when brands haven't supported their products, customers put videos out there that can actually kill brands. Yep. Uh, they can kill dealers too. That, and that's scary. If you can kill a brand, you can actually really destroy a dealer very quickly. And I know of some dealers that were of, of that brand that, that were really hurt. Uh, by the, those actions of, of customers. So you really have to be on, on, on point when it comes to getting it right. And it's a credit to the VACC for the service that you provide. And I think it's very important to highlight, you know, we, we, we rewind back four years ago when COVID hit. The VACC and Jeff Willem in particular led the way with dealers who were clear in their communication to say, industry's open and we're open. Because there was so much doubt about, oh, how can you go buy a car? Can you get your car serviced? All this sort of stuff. There was so much ambiguity and fear. And I think it's great when you get an association that takes a leadership position and says, hey, we're out here. We're actually helping you, the consumer, by being open. And it's okay. Yep. And we've actually got your best interest at heart by having a high standard within our industry. So. Uh, well, th- well thanks, thanks for that recognition, Mark. That, that's great because we, we look back on that COVID period I see that Daniel Andrews was quite often praised for fronting up every day to the media. Well, I can tell you, Jeff Gwillem fronted up every morning at, and after going to bed when government was releasing their positions or their new directions at 11.59 p.m. and going through those and reading those and understanding them and then getting ready to hit the hustings to the media at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning and then for members to have information in their inbox by 9 a.m. so they knew what they could and couldn't do. But these are the true heroes, the the, the John Currys who would work till 11 o'clock at night returning phone calls, these type of people, the, you know, the, the Nigel Mullers and our apprentices who were speaking to apprentices' parents about why, you know, they, they were taken off the tools for a certain period and, and, the, and the uncertainty of the future. And, and, to, and to salvage out of those great results, I think you're right, it is testament to a good organisation like VACC. No, Mick, thanks very much. It's been a really interesting discussion and I think something, you know, it's so complex and it's really important to get across it and deep understanding of it. So thanks very much for your time. Well, thank you for listening. Hopefully you got as much out of the podcast conversation with Mick as we did. Thanks very much for listening. We'll speak to you again next week.